Thank you for staying with us. We're still on one on one talking about education. So, Jenny, please carry on. So I was trying to make the point that you have a tertiary education system that represents about 2 million of a population of 200 million, mm. approximately 200 million people. So if you take the numbers again and you look and you say, well, if they say indeed that Nigeria's population, 60% of our population is youth, 60% of 100 million is 60 million, 60% of 200 million is 120 million. Mm. Essentially, what it means is that you have to have an education system that accommodates 120 million people from early childhood all the way to on-the-job training. True. So within that 120 million, ASU is fighting for funding for 2 million. million. What happens to the rest of the mm. population? And shouldn't that be a concern? Why is it that, that the system is the way that it is? It's fundamental. It, 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 I think the bottom line is really accountability. Okay. The Constitution of the Federal Republic of Nigeria says, it offers a guarantee for free education, qualitative education to every citizen of Nigeria. That's what the constitution says. The Child Rights Act reinforces that of 2003, reinforces that and says every child has a right to education because we understand that without education, you cannot be a good citizen. You cannot be a productive member of, the, of your society. True. So constitutionally we say so, but if you go to the constitution, you will see there, it says we're practicable. Hmm. So we wrote a constitution that offered a guarantee and then provided a back door for us to abdicate that responsibility. And all ourselves as citizens, as well as the government, we have gone through that back door with great happiness and abdicated our responsibility. So there is no accountability within the system. If you can hold the only person who is held accountable in the education system is the student. Hmm. The student doesn't pass an exam, he fails. The student has to write, has to write a thesis he has to develop it somehow, he fails. The student gets out of the university, out of the education system, and goes to get a job, and cannot get the job because he's not ready for industry, he fails. What happens to all the people in the entire value chain, from the highest of levels to the lowest of levels, what is their accountability to the student, and how do, they, how do you hold them effectively accountable? That's the role of the office of the citizen. So how As do parents. we how do we begin so how do we begin to do that because I remember when I was in university um, some of our lecturers would say A is for God B is for me and then you guys get C D <laughs> and E you know along the way so yeah. even the student is not even you know like he's going to make an effort but he's already even demoralized and then I have to add it to a, a second question how do we begin to change because I find that many times many students who have failed within the Nigerian educational system leave the country and then they're excellent students everywhere else. How do we begin to um, change that? How do we begin to enforce? So yes, you've told us that the office of the citizen is, is important. So how do I begin to want to do this? Because oftentimes, even in schools, when the students have student unions that try to make you know, lecturers accountable, if you remember the um, report done by um, uh, BBC where some lecturers were exposed, even yes. some lecturers came out to defend those lecturers, even when there were video evidence to show. So how do you begin to do that? Because when student unions begin to try and make lecturers accountable, they are victimized, expelled. How do we do that? What do we need to do? And this, this is where it's a great question. This is where we have to, because we, we cannot abstract the education sector from the rest of the society. Sure. The, the challenge is in the, in the larger society. So if we admit that we are not really practicing, um, uh, we're not really playing our roles in a democracy, um, and then we, we understand that, that the structure that we ha have is top-down. That's why there is so much emphasis on who, who the leadership is in every layer, in every layer of our organization, every layer of our society. If you go to school and you see the structures in a school, you have something called a PTA. Yes. The PTA holds the school accountable. Accountable. Right? True. And, this, and the school then has to answer to the PTA for certain things that it does. When that system does not work, then the school, is the, the, the school administration and, and, and ownership is completely liberated from any accountability. They can do what they want to do. But in the university They're, system, how do you have a PTA meeting? Exactly. Because that happens in a primary so now, and secondary so now, school. So now this was where the unions came up. Because the unions came up as a means of applying some kind of a check in a system, in a former system that we had. So you had the, the uh, NANS, you had the ASU, you had the non-academic staff union and all that sort of stuff. So these guys were really supposed to be like a, um, a counterbalance to authority, which resided at that time in the public universities in the federal government. Okay. Over time, particularly during the military regime, they worked to break the power of those unions. 
And by breaking the power of those unions, they liberated themselves from responsibility. We moved into a democratic administrative, democratic, democratic environment, and they continued, the civilians who now took over continued, continued the same attitude as though, they, as though they were military. And so the lack of accountability is not there. What is the how? I think that there are two things, that really two or three things that need to happen. The first is that, and, 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 and unfortunately, all these things have to start from the top uh, because that's the structure that we currently have. First of all, we have to accept that we cannot, in the year 2020, be building an education system that's in, on a 19th century model. So that means that we have to fundamentally re-envision education for the 21st century. Okay. And when we do so, we will find that a lot of people, including ASU, will be uncomfortable. Mm. Because what it means is that the ASU lecturer is no longer evaluated based on what his vice chancellor or his head of department or his faculty head thinks. Because the students will have, in the 21st century learning environment, the students will take courses from a lecturer in Harvard. He will take courses from a lecturer in MIT. Mm -hmm. He will take courses from a lecturer in, in, in the university in China. He will take from Australia. And so the university lecturer in ASU, in Nigeria, is no longer measuring himself against his neighbor, but against the global standard. And the student will be able to pick and choose what courses he, wants to, he or she wants to attend from anywhere in the world. Hmm. That fundamental transformation is a threat to the existing system. Because then those who, are not, who cannot meet up to that standard will fall by the wayside. Okay. Uh, today I was going through a document for um, Eton College. Eton College is a secondary school in, in, um, in, 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 the, um, in the UK. And it's one of the oldest and one of the most famous schools. And I was looking at the house masters and the credentials of the house masters, those who manage the students in the boarding, in the boarding school boarding environment. There wasn't a single one who didn't have like a PhD or a master's from an Oxford or a Cambridge. Wow. They had studied things like neuroscience, nuclear physics, chemistry, the classics in Oxford and all that. Secondary school. How does a secondary school student in Umaya competes with yes. a secondary school student who has gone to an eating college mm. in a flat world that has been created by the 21st century. You made a good point around what happens to students when he leaves Nigeria. And I want, to, I, want to mark, I want you to mark it by two things. First of all, for almost 40 years, we have been doing something called alternative to practical as an exam. Okay. Alternative to practical is an exam that was put in place for students who didn't have access to labs who actually never did the titration, didn't do the experiments that were required to do in, the, in physics, chemistry, and biology. Okay. And that alternative to practical has become the de facto exam because the schools don't have labs. Now, you do alternative to practical, and then you take an exam to get into university to study medicine. You have never once done a, 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 a single experiment in a lab. Mm -hmm. So what do we do? If you look at the cost of implementing laboratories, each laboratory in a secondary school would cost something between 80 and 100 million naira for one lab. Wow. So how many of them can we possibly build? You, you need to be able to understand the limitations that you're facing. If we took the entire federal budget and applied it to education, we would probably not even be able to meet up with the infrastructure. Okay, so this leads me to my, to my next question of how, how can we begin to merge technology to help with education, not just on the tertiary um, level, but also across board so that we don't have to, because even you know, the open university system um, that we have in Nigeria that we assumed will make things better still is very, um, you know, hands. so yes, the students don't physically go in except when they have exams, but they really don't use so much technology. How do we begin to use technology to reduce this cost and to improve education you know, on, on a whole, not just from tertiary, but from primary, secondary to the, the tertiary? First, the, first, the first challenge we have is not the how. The first, the first question, the first challenge we have is that we don't believe it. If we believed it, we would have committed to it. Even but I think we, we believe even, it. Sorry no. to interrupt, because the pandemic now has... What did now Asu has, tell you? No, no, no. no, no, what, no did just, Asu, what did Asu tell us about online? Okay, yes, well, true. So, so they, they said it is impossible. But they, they, they it said it to be practicable, because during this time, most schools now, even for the secondary schools, they've alternated the days where they go to school you two and days I know, week, You and I understand Three days a week. We know it's a reality. Okay. But if the association of, like, the association, the academic association of universities are highest, where all our eggheads are, 
tell you it cannot work, then what, does the, what do you expect the government to do? Force it down their throats? Who's going to make it happen? The issue is that in two, in, by 2014, the Indira Gandhi National Open University had more students, at 2.2 million students, mm. than the entire 167 universities in Nigeria today have. One university, online university, had more students than the entirety of all uh, 167 physical universities. But you know, I think it also so, alluded to the So, to the so what problem. we need to do is this. What I, what, so the first thing is, and, and sorry, just, just to kind of, because no, I know no we problem. always have time, time, time limitations. Yeah. The first thing is that we have to accept, we have to make a national commitment. Okay. Right? And that national commitment can only come when we have an open and, and public acceptance that the 19th century model for education has to go. And we must, as a country, go to the 21st century. And you cannot go to a 21st century model without accepting and embracing technology as the fundamental enabler mm. of learning. There's so many questions I want to ask. There's so many questions, but sadly we can't take, you know, time because I want to ask about internet penetration. How are we going to have that, you know, across the we don't need the internet. We, 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 we don't, across the country. We don't need the internet. No, no. What do we need? There? Just please let's just make this your last one. What do we need to be able to go fully so online? So if, if this were a classroom for me, and every building around here was housed parents with children who wanted to go to my school, okay, what I would do is that I would set up. A, a set of Wi-Fi access using okay. a simple router, no internet. My computer will be here, all my lessons will be here, and anybody who is around, just like you use your Wi-Fi, okay. right? Your Wi-Fi, you're connecting to me okay. this time, not connecting to the internet. And anything that I broadcast from my computer here, anybody in this vicinity who logs on to my, my, my network will get exactly the same content. So 80% of the content that is required, even up to 90% of the content that is required to teach does not require connection to the internet. Okay. So I can create in a rural community. I can bring the world to a rural community. How would I do that? I take my laptop. I download all the content that I require onto my laptop. It's powered for eight hours. I go with, I pass my neighbor generator. I go to a primary school and I take a small projector, and I go to a primary school, and I project on the wall. I will run every single class to world-class standard off of that my laptop, because I can have the entirety of Encyclopedia Britannica on my laptop. I can have all the lessons from early childhood to, through to university. I can have over 6,000, and it's not theory. Mm. We've done this in Cross River States, where we went by canoes into villages, and we taught teachers how to, how to use laptops in their classrooms. Wow, interesting, interesting. Sadly, we will have to go on. Please, we'd like to have you again. I hope you, you will make time to come to again. Come Thank over. you very much. Thank, Thank you. you for having me. That's all we can take on this episode of One on One. Please join us again. I'm Fumi Unwa Jefe. Mm -hmm.